Hello, this is Brother Kumar from the Math Department at BYU-Idaho. And these videos will be covering inference for one mean sigma known, primarily dealing with confidence intervals. Before we get into that, I'd like to review parameter and statistic, the definitions of those two. First of all, a parameter is a measure of the population that is typically unknown, but we'd like to estimate it. For instance, the two most common parameters in the world of statistics is mu, which is our population mean, and sigma, which is our population standard deviation. A statistic is a measure, on the other hand, is a measure from a sample. The statistic is used to measure the unknown parameter. And here are two mo the two most common examples of, st of statistics. One is x bar, which represents our sample mean, and s, which is our sample standard deviation. So x bar, our sample mean, is used to estimate mu, which is our population mean. And s, which is our sample standard deviation, is used to estimate sigma, which is our population standard deviation. Okay. So then what I'd like to do is let's go to the next slide. Now I want to do is review. Uh, if you remember, we talked about the distribution of sample means back in, uh, back in Unit 1. And the sampling distribution of sample means has many sample means for many possible samples. However, due to time and money, one cannot take multiple samples or sample the whole population, so we infer based on one sample. So the statistic or the sample mean can be anywhere in the distribution of sample means. Okay? So if you remember, uh, the distribution of sample means is, uh, has a distribution where we have all possible sample means here. But in the end, when we take a sample, we're only going to get just one sample mean. However, even though we get one sample mean, we can do something which is called a confidence interval. A confidence interval consists of an unknown parameter. Or, let me start that sentence again. A confidence interval for an unknown parameter consists of an interval of numbers. So a basic definition of a confidence interval is where we take a point estimate plus or minus a margin of error. Okay? Example, for instance, if we're trying to decide how many people will vote for the president, President Obama, before uh, the general election. Say, for instance, we find that out of our sample, 48% of people will vote for President Obama. 48% represents our point estimate. But, uh, but if you've seen uh, polling before, especially a political polling, you know that there is a margin of error. So say, for instance, in our poll, we find that 48% of people vote for President Obama, plus or minus a margin of error of 4%. We can get what's called a confidence interval. So, our, so we believe with some level of confidence that somewhere between 44 and 52% of all people will vote for President Obama. So in essence, what does a confidence interval mean? That means we are X percent confident that a true value is between is between two numbers, is between the upper limit and the lower limit. Okay? And so now which leads to how we get a formula the, the formula for constructing a confidence interval. And here's the formula right here. So this is the one minus alpha times 100 percent confidence interval formula. Where what we do is we take X bar minus a critical value z, which I'll talk about in a minute what that is, times our standard deviation divided by the square root of n. This over here to the left of the comma is what's called the lower bound of the lower limit. Over here to the right, where instead of subtracting, we add um, z times sigma, or the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, uh, uh, with our sample mean to get the upper bound. So we get a lower bound over here. And we get an, excuse me, we get a lower bound here. Let me just try this one more time. We get a lower bound here, and we get an upper bound over here. Okay? The difference between the lower bound is that we subtract, and the upper bound we add. Okay? So uh, let's go through the definitions for this this formula for this uh, formula for a confidence interval. X bar represents the sample mean. I'll skip this next one here, but sigma is the population standard deviation, and n is the sample size. The margin of error is z times sigma divided by the square root of n, or the standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size. That's the margin of error. Notice we add and subtract the margin of error from our sample mean okay, to get the lower bound and the upper bound. Now going back to the thing that I skipped, we have something which is called a critical value. Okay? A critical value is an, the number that, that goes here as part of our confidence interval or our margin of error. But basically, I'll show you how to get that here, but there's, there's three 
generally speaking, three critical values that you'll need for this type of confidence interval. One for the 90% confidence interval, one for the 95, and one for the 99% confidence interval. Okay. Now these are the three most common levels of confidence intervals. So it could be uh, levels of confidence. Excuse me. There could be others, but these are the three most common. Now, basically, how we, if we have a level of confidence of 90%, our alpha, if you remember, alpha being the probability of committing a type one error, or the level of significance is 0.1. So if you sum these two up, even though this is in percentage form and this is in decimal form, they sum up to one. Same with this one here, 95% our alpha is 0.05. 99% our alpha is 0.01. Now how we get this critical value, these numbers here, you can take them at face value. The critical value for the 90% is 1.645. For the level of confidence of 95, it's 1.96. And for the level of confidence of 99%, it's 2.58. But where you can get those, if you go to the probability applet, you shade to the middle, and you type in 0.9 for 90%, you get the critical value of 1.645. Okay, you shade, you type in 0.95, and you get 1.96 here. And then for the last one, the 99% confidence interval, you get 2.576, and that goes well. I rounded up here, but basically that's what you get here. So like I said, these 90, 95, and 99% are the three most common levels of confidence. Okay. Um, but there are other levels of confidence that you could use, and so that's why I that's why I showed just these three. Is is that these are the primary ones? Okay. So now what I want to do is go through an example of how to do a confidence interval. Okay. So based on historic data obtained from Brother Bergstrom, grade point average of students at BYU Idaho is known to have a population standard deviation of 0.68. We want to create a 95 a confidence interval for the true mean GPA for last semester. A total of 24 people were surveyed and asked to report their GPA from last semester. The mean of the GPAs in the sample was computed to be 3.263. So the first question is, what is the point estimate for the true mean GPA? Well, the point estimate is just this number here, which is our sample mean. And in this case, the, the point estimate is 3.263. The next question, what is the margin of error when doing a 95% confidence interval? Well, in this case, the margin of error is just everything to the right of the minus sign or the plus sign. So we take the z-critical value times the standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size. So when we do that, we, we since we're doing a 95% confidence interval, our critical value is 1.96, like what you, what you saw in the last slide here. It's 1.96, okay? And so then we take that times it by our standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size. And we saw for that our margin of error is 0.27. Then, find the 95% confidence interval for the true mean GPA. We take our point estimate, plus or minus our margin of error, and we get our lower bound and our upper bound, which is 2.99 and 3.54. So therefore, we are 95% confident that the true mean GPA is between 2.99 and 3.54. What if we're doing a 99% confidence interval for the true mean GPA? Well, the only thing that changes is that this number changes right here. And that changes to where we get it to where this is 2.58. That's the critical value for the 99% confidence interval. And so when we solve for that, we get our lower bound is 2.90 and our upper, upper bound is 3.62. Okay. How about, uh, so therefore, we, can, we, we would interpret this by saying we're 99% confident that the true mean GPA is between 2.90 and 3.62. Okay. Now let's just say we take a sample of 50 people and got the same sample mean. Find the 95% confidence interval. So if the, the only thing that would change is from here to down here is our sample size. And so we would get a, a confidence interval for the lower bound 3.07 and the upper bound is 3.43. So we're 95% confident that the true mean GPA is between 3.07 and 3.45. So lastly, what happens to the width of the confidence interval as the level of confidence and the sample size increases? Well, as the level of confidence increases, the width of the confidence interval increases. Okay? Going back to this problem, we went from a 95 to a 99% confidence interval, the width increases. Okay? Then the next question, and as the sample size increases, the width of the confidence interval decreases. So going back to this, as we increase our sample size, the width of our margin of error or our confidence interval increases. I'll stop the video and I'll continue with part two of this lesson.